House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. All right, you are back in the House of Mystery. It is the new year of 2023, and it's me, Mr. Dave Martino. <laughs> Present. I have returned. Yeah, yeah. The the they, they were not waiting for you. I hate to say that. No. <laughs> it's, you know, I only hear about the complaints, and nobody's complaining yeah. about you, so you're going to have to do something a little bit more controversial. Okay. <laughs> go out and do something. Mug, mug someone on the streets. Go to Boston mm. downtown. <laughs> just remember you said that, Al. Yeah, and just, you know, and say, hey, lady, and rip her purse off, kick her a few times, <laughs> make sure she's old. <laughs> and, and you know, and call her some names, really nasty names, even if you don't know, you know, and, and just run. And then don't forget to mention your name. Okay. Okay. You know. I'm running all this down. Good. Now, <laughs> it, it, I'm on it. You're on it. Did you stay up for New Year's? So the so the ball drops? <laughs> I did. Oh, your and your I balls did. dropped? <laughs> they did, finally. Yes. <laughs> it took 50 years or so. It took 50 years. Yeah, 51. Oh. Yeah. Well, so, so what did you do? You watch like um, I'm sorry, but I've been I didn't because I you know everybody knows I had one of the uh, an ilk dog and so I was busy <clears throat> with that. But yeah. you know I'm going through the reviews and, and God, what is this? Talk about depressing. So I know CNN had uh, Anderson Cooper and yeah. um, you know what's his name, the guy that drinks all the time, um, yeah. and they stopped him from drinking, so he was sober. <laughs> and, and just before the, you know, so when when everyone's celebrating for the last countdown, what are they talking about? They're talking about people that died in the year. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is real That's fun. awesome. Yeah, this is real fun. You know, everyone's <laughs> drinking in the back and counting down and all. Of a <laughs> and we have this person that died in an avalanche, and this one. My God, you know, get the booze out again and stop this. <laughs> what did you watch? What do you watch? I don't know, I think we were watching some movie, and then I we, we flipped over right at the end just to watch the ball drop. Oh, and so you're still doing that. Well, great. Yeah. Well, and yeah, did we you guys... Wanted, you know, it's kind of, you know... Yeah. You're another year closer to death? Another, yes, another year closer to death. Oh, great. Like in, like in the Pink Floyd song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we say that. It's another year, and, well, this might be it. You know? Yeah, this could be. This could be the last year. Well, it could be. That's positive. Positive thinking. I well, you know, after watching Anderson Cooper and, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> depressing. Let's hear about everyone that suffered this year. And he was talking about the hangings. They're still hanging people in Iran, and I was thinking, oh, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, save that for the show news. Like, don't you know? This is New Year's. People are, you know, they're waiting for Duran Duran. <laughs> yeah, right. This is kind of crazy, you know, because I'm at the age now where I'm not going to wait outside in the cold with no. all those people in the crowds till midnight just to have Duran Duran come up. I mean, come on. No. I mean, that's just too much. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't wait for anybody. I'm not putting down Duran Duran. Come on. Mm -hmm. You know, been there, done that. 80 years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, enough about the negative stuff. Let's get to something positive. Yeah. Yes. Um, who we got here? Okay. We got a returning guest. Mind you, it's been a long time. Been a long, long time. I think it was 15 or something. I can't remember. I'm getting too old. Um, so anyway, he's a New York Times bestselling author, and he's got a new book out. And yeah. it really looks interesting. So uh, let's get Mr. Jay Margolis here. How are you doing, Jay? Doing pretty well. How are you? Well, you know, I just I'd rather not say. <laughs> um, but you know, listen. Um, so you, um, your new book, My Merrill, and it's Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood, and me. But you've got a co-author who is kind of telling, is telling their story. And that's uh, Terry um, Carger. Um, so how did you come across Terry, and, and what, what kind of, how did this come about? I was researching my uh, New York Times bestselling um, book called The Murder of Marilyn Monroe Case Closed, and I started to um, interview people. I called them up, and I called up Terry, and she wasn't, 
very keen at that time about writing a book because she said, oh, I don't want to have people think I'm trying to profit from knowing Marilyn. And I've seen a lot of sensational headlines about Marilyn, and it's kind of disturbing how I'd like to show who she really was, the human side, the one that most people don't know about because she knew her before she was famous. Uh, Terry met Marilyn when Terry was six years old and Marilyn was 21, and that was uh, her first babysitter was Marilyn Monroe. Imagine Marilyn Monroe being your first babysitter and only babysitter. Mm -hmm. And that was before she was famous, and she was dating uh, Terry's father, uh, Fred Carter, who was 32 years old and Marilyn's 21, and, and that was uh, Marilyn's first vocal coach. And if you listen to Ladies of the Chorus in 1948, which Fred trained her for, she does a beautiful job. Her voice is very elegant and it sounds a lot better than um, some of her future films actually it just sounds very you know wonderful and it's it's a it's a good thing to listen to if you want to check out some of her earlier songs she does a fantastic job and so terry was kind of like you know the zealot you know like that woody allen film where this guy walks through history or or like that forrest gump film except that terry's not stupid you know she just like, walked through <laughs> history and it, <laughs> Kind of like, you know, she's meeting all these people. Even Terry bumped into JFK, and, and you know, before he got elected, like a week before he got elected, she bumps into him at USC, a, a speech he was giving, and he went into the crowd, and, and she got to see him face-to-face, -face and she's like, oh, wow, she, you know, he's pretty handsome. And um, so <laughs> she just walked through all these people. I mean, her grandfather was Frederick Maxwell Carter Sr. They called him Max Carter, and he was like the guy who started silent films. He started Metro Pictures, and when he died in 1922 at the age of 46 of a heart attack, you know, they, they uh, combined Metro Pictures with Goldwyn and Mayer became MGM. So, you know, her whole history is like from the beginning of film, and it just continues on and even until today. <laughs> Wow. So how well? How old is she today? She's at Sorry. 81, actually. She's wow. 82 this year in July. I feel like that. But, <laughs> uh, wow, so that's great. So, so how did you get her to kind of get go along with this book and get get involved in it? Like, what was what was the uh, trigger for her? Well, she said, "Let me talk to my stepbrother, Michael Reagan. You know, the son of uh, President Ronald Reagan." And what happened there was. When Terry was 11, her father, Fred, married Jane Wyman, who won an Academy Award for Johnny Belinda. And she had been recently divorced from uh, Ronald Reagan, so Michael and Maureen Reagan became Terry's stepbrother and stepsister. They still talk today. They go on vacations, you know, Michael Reagan and Terry Reagan and their husbands and wives. And, you know, uh, uh, Michael Reagan's uh, wife, Colleen's a travel agent, so they get some really nice um, deals on that. And, uh, and, and so Terry says, let me talk to Michael. And, and, uh, Michael says, well, you know, you've, you know, you really knew who Marilyn really was behind the image. And I don't see that in a lot of these books. You know, you really have like a duty kind of to kind of present that. And so Terry says, oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll talk to Jay and see what happens. And so she eventually agreed on, you know, Michael's encouragement. And, uh, he wrote the forward to the book and, and uh, it was, it's just a very nice story, and it's refreshing because you don't see any book about Marilyn Monroe where it's from a child's perspective, because Terry met Marilyn when uh, Terry was six years old, Marilyn's 21, and then she knew her for 14 years until Terry was 21 and Marilyn was 36. And so this is a very... Um, a rare story and where Terry knew her longer than her three husbands. And also Terry's mother became the mother that Marilyn never had. When, you know, Marilyn was seven years old, her mother was in an institution. And so Nana, uh, everybody has a Nana, but, you know, Terry called her grandmother Nana. Her name was Ann Connolly. And uh, that was the mother that, that Marilyn needed. That And her whole family, like, adopted Marilyn. And it was, so when people say that Marilyn never had anybody, well, she had the Carter family, and they, they loved her for, you know, the rest of her life starting in 1948. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's important to do that. I think you're right. There are so many people and books out there about uh, famous people, and it, it always just gives you that professional angle. They never get into their personal, because I think what a lot of people forget is these, these stars and celebrities and actors and singers they're just like normal people that have a career that's sort of in front of everyone. And they, sometimes they get bizarre from being so popular, but I think, I think that's great. Um, so what do you hope people are getting 
out of this book then? What, what is it you want people to take away from this book? I want people to take away the fact that Marilyn was a human being. She wasn't just a sex symbol. She wasn't the, the uh, quote-unquote dumb blonde that the studios love to present. She didn't want to keep making those types of movies. She did fight against it, and there were times when they were trying to get her to do certain movies, and she said no, and it, and it su succeeded. And so she, you know, Terry saw a, a person who was very smart, very shy, but also a very kind person. And, you know, she loved Terry's family because Terry's family was used to fame. They weren't going, you know, all crazy about fame, like, oh, my God, this movie star, because they knew her before she was famous. And then when she became famous, they just treated her like they normally did when she, they had her before she was famous. And so Marilyn felt like she had a place to go home to, a place where people weren't going to, you know, sell her out and say, hey, I got a picture with her. How much do you want for it? It wasn't like that at all. They would keep her confidence. And, you know, Terry was a kid when she, uh, um, you know, um, first met Marilyn. And so Marilyn, you know, loved children because they wouldn't backstab her. Like some of the women would be speaking nonsense about her behind the set. And so, you know, Marilyn once said to Terry, says, I know that you'll never betray me. And Terry's like, of course I wouldn't, you know. And so it was a kind of a, a, a place to feel at home and comfortable. And because they were all... Um, you know, knew about movie stars. It wasn't anything special to be a movie star. So it was just like friends hanging out together. And that was something that is rarely seen in any Maryland book I've ever read. And I've read them all, believe me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I've been trying to do that too. Maybe you can write a book about me. Everyone thinks I'm just a dumb blonde. <laughs> I take me seriously, you know, when they say I can't sing. <laughs> all sorts of things. Mind you, I can't. Um <laughs> Well, it's, it's, so that's interesting. So, how did you, how do you um, feel about um, Marilyn's relationship with all these people? Because, from from her side, do, do you think she got along with people like Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman and all that? Was there, did they have a bond, or was there, were they sort of different? Well, you know, sometimes there was a little bit of friction, but all, other times it was just like a professional courtesy. You know, just like what I mean by that is. You know, that Jane was very well aware that Fred was, you know, with Marilyn before. And so there was a, at Jane Wyman's birthday party, she, uh, in 1953, she let Marilyn come along because she knew how close she was to Nana. She wasn't going to just say, hey, don't come because I know, you know, Nana's close to you. So because of that relationship, she understood and she allowed it. She wasn't jealous. She wasn't trying to, you know, get one up on Marilyn or, have any kind of resentment there. And so she attended that party and, 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 you know, Michael Reagan was seven years old at the time and he said that, you know, um, that's the day he met Marilyn. And so beforehand he was trying to get a, a birthday present for his mom and he saw this silver serving tray where there's a nude Marilyn Monroe from her calendar pictures that had uh, leaked recently. And so he's looking at that seven year old. He's like, Oh my God, she's naked on that silver serving tray. Let's get that for mom. And Marine says, we can't get that for mom. Michael get something else. <laughs> and so they end up getting a sugar bowl and they wrap it up, you know, from Brewster's a jewelry store. And it's just really something. And I, I mean, it was funny because that night, just hours after they get that present, you know, he sees, uh, he's like a knock on the door and Marilyn comes out and says, hi, how are you guys? And uh, Mike was like, uh, he's stunned, and then he says, fine, come on in. But, you know, he says that people ask him, when did you know there was a God? And he says, when Marilyn Monroe showed up on my doorstep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's when he knew there was a God. <laughs> I wonder if he if he asked if, why the carpet didn't match the drapes. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't oh, the, bad... that, that wasn't the, the thing he was focusing on, actually. <laughs> no, I guess not. But you know, I have to say it. You know, I have to get the new year started right. <laughs> well, what, what what was the biggest surprise for you when you were doing the research and you were talking a lot with Terry? Were there certain things that you kind of were, oh my, I didn't expect that. Well, I didn't expect to see the sort of mischievous side of Maryland because it's rarely written about in biographies and. You know, when you talk about Jane Wyman before, about was there a friction or anything like that, I mean, I was more like a jokey type of thing. And, you know, when the, the seven-year itch came out, there was a big cardboard cutout, and, uh, you know, um, Marilyn had girlfriends, actually. You know, Fred's sister, um, Mary, who was Terry's um, Aunt Mary, and there was uh, Terry's mother, Patty, who was an entertainment lawyer for the stars like Cary Grant, and even Leon Shamroy, who did Marilyn's first screen test. And so... 
you know, one time they're called the Devilish Trio, Patty, Mary, and Marilyn. And they went and stole that cardboard cutout from the courtyard and then just put it on Jane Wyman's lawn. And they had a big laugh over that, you know. And this was when Fred and, and Jane were uh, separating for the first time. And so it was kind of funny how, you know, Marilyn was just totally laughing about that and thought that was the funniest thing. I'm sure Jane Wyman didn't find it very funny. <laughs> <laughs> there were other interesting things, too. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Terry was 13 when her cousin Jackie was getting married at 18 years old to Herb Rigoni. And that's when there was this film, this homemade film that uh, that Jackie's father took. He took a, a film of Marilyn, which we show in the book. We show still frames of it. She looks like she just came off a movie set, Marilyn did. And so Marilyn snuck into the choir loft upstairs because she knew that Jane and Fred were going to be in attendance. She didn't want to cause a distraction for Jackie's big wedding day. And so when she was um, sneaking out as they were leaving, uh, you know, Marilyn and Nana happened to bump into, you know, uh, Fred and Jane. And, and, you know, Fred looked like he wanted to be somewhere else. And, and Marilyn just kind of put her hand to her mouth and gasped. And, and Jane just said, um, let's go. And, you know, she, she said that to Fred. And they ran out of that parking lot and ran to the car and they drove out of there. <laughs> but that was the one, one thing that irritated Jane Wyman was seeing her at that, at that wedding. She didn't expect that. <laughs> wow. Well, over the years, did Terry notice any change in Marilyn as she became more famous or, you know, in her, in her private uh, dealings? Or did, she, did Marilyn stay the same behind the scenes? Well, she became to be more, you know, Marilyn was more suspicious, you know, not of Terry's family, but of just people in general. She felt that now that she was being focused on by so many people, that she's just like, well, can I get a break? Do I always have to walk out and have people with cameras all over me? And, you know, one time Marilyn was at an airline counter, and Joe DiMaggio escorted her with one bodyguard at the car, you know, and then um, that was outside of Terry's house. And then there was, like, one bodyguard that go inside of Terry's house just to kind of protect her because, like, God knows people were stalkers back in those days. And, you know, she had to have some kind of protection. It was when she was famous, it just became kind of crazy. And, and Marilyn said to Terry about a year before Marilyn died, they, they met up at um, the Polo Lounge in uh, Beverly Hills, and Marilyn says, well, can't just people leave me alone? I understand, and I, I, I love this, you know, adoration, but uh, enough already, you know? I mean, can I just be me? You know, can I just have some time to myself? Could you imagine what it would have been like for her with social media the way it is now? Oh, cruel. It, she would take those comments, and she'd be really hurt over them. And, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Warren, who's uh, Terry's cousin, said that I know that uh, the, the world today would be very cruel to Marilyn, he said, and she would not be able to handle it, believe me. Though she, yeah. She'd see those comments, she'd be reading every last one and uh, take it to heart, and it would put her in a big depression, I'm sure. Yeah, because people are, are, you know, so mean on social media at times. You know, they'd be calling her fat and all sorts of stuff. They'd be real. Yeah. They're, they're vicious, you know. They're, it's just it's crazy. Um, Absolutely. What are what are some of the things that you found out about Marilyn that you um, didn't know before? Well, I'm I didn't know that she uh, was going to be wrapped in complete cellophane for Howard Thomas, the vice president of Packard Bell, who was going out with uh, uh, Terry's mother, Patty, after Patty and Fred got divorced. And uh, so, you know, Patty's saying, "What do I get for the man who has everything?" And so, you know, <laughs> Aunt Mary and Patty put. This is part of the devil's trio uh, type of mischievous things. I put Marilyn in a bunch of cellophane and a, a, like a big box to cover her. And, a, a, you know, and so Patty says, open your present. And so he takes off the, the, the ribbon on the box, takes out the box, unwraps the cellophane, and there's Marilyn Monroe and says, oh, it's getting a little stuffy in there. I'm so glad that you let me out, Howard. You know, and gives him a, key, a kiss on the cheek, and that was really something surprising to me. I, these little stories are so cute. And very funny. I mean, Marilyn would do other funny things, too. When she was introducing her dog, uh, Josepha, who was a little chihuahua that she had, 
she wanted to act like it was this big, horrendous dog that was going to scare the heck out of people. So she says, have you met my dog, Fang? And so everybody says, Terry's like, no, I've never met Fang. And so she's like, come here, Fang, get out here. And then it turned out to be a little chihuahua instead of a big old dog like everybody was expecting. She'd play pranks on people like that. And I'm sure that a lot of people who have known anything about Maryland never heard of this stuff before. It's very interesting. Yeah, I'm in cellophane right now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you been kidnapped? Are you okay? Do we need to call the police? No, no, I, I kind of do this for fun. This is, this is a good time for me. You know, at a certain age, you just do these weird things. Um, well, well, that's pretty cool. So now, did she tell any stories about um, the Kennedys and, uh, you know, Marilyn's involvement with the Kennedys? Because that seemed to be one of the most popular interactions that Marilyn had, especially with politicians. Well, here's the funny thing. I'll tell it to you like this, because this is how it happened. Uh, Terry told me that while Marilyn was alive, she didn't hear about the affairs with President John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy, but that after Marilyn died, both Nana and Terry's mother, Patty, both told her that they knew about the affairs with both Kennedy brothers, John and Robert. And uh, Nana was concerned that the last affair with Robert led to her death. And so, because, you know, the day before, you know, Marilyn's calling Nana on August 3rd. You know, the Life magazine article comes out. Marilyn's calling everybody to celebrate. How happy can she be and then kill herself the next day? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, Nana was like, that doesn't make any sense. She was so happy that day celebrating how she had just gotten her job back and she was going to make a two-picture deal for a million dollars. I don't think that sounds like somebody that wants to kill themselves. And so, you know, it, the, the affairs were mentioned after Marilyn died. And so, according to Terry, she heard about it from both Nana and Patty. In fact, Patty, her mother, believed that Marilyn was murdered and that, it, that there was a big high-level conspiracy going on. And she told that theory to a couple of friends. And uh, then shortly thereafter, Patty was nearly run off the road. And she thinks both events are connected. In fact, Fred thought that she was, you know, her death was very mysterious, and she just, he, he just was very confused about that. And uh, most of Terry's family believed that she was murdered. Uh, Terry said, I never believed she committed suicide. And Bennett, her cousin, said, I will always believe that, that Marilyn was murdered, and I hope the guy rots in hell. So did Fred stay close with Marilyn after they sort of split and all that stuff? They, they had a, a romantic relationship from 1948 in about March until uh, spring of 1949. And they would always meet up, like, in 1955, you know, at the, you know, Waldorf Astoria. You know, was, you know, he wanted her to meet Tyrone Power, and she was too, you know, uh, she had been drinking too much that day. So he said, forget it. I'll let you sleep. You know, so there was a continuation, even after he had married Jane Wyman and gotten divorced, because they married and divorced twice, uh, you know, Fred and Jane Wyman. And uh, so there was a continuing, you know, relationship, because Marilyn never let go of Fred's mother. And um, and so this was something that was a connection that lasted, even with Fred, until her death. And that was what's really interesting. You see, Marilyn um, thought that Nana meant, uh, meant a lot, and in fact, Marilyn gave a 14 karat charm bracelet to Nana, which says, To Anne, with my deepest love and friendship, Marilyn. Can you imagine getting a 14 karat gold you know, charm bracelet in 1953 and Marilyn's paying on that in installments? I would have taken the cellophane. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. You know, that's, yeah. That's, it's, just, it's crazy. Um, you say Fred and, and, and Terry and all those, they all sort of are suspicious of Marilyn's death as well. Well, exactly. And, uh, you know, you can understand why, because what happened was, you know, if you look at the autopsy, Marilyn had enough drugs in her blood to kill three people. Now, I don't say that she swallowed 47 nebutals and 17 chlorohydrates, but the equivalent of in her blood was equal to about 47 nebutals and 17 chlorohydrates. She's got about 64 pills, according to the blood reports, the toxicology reports. But she has nothing in her stomach. She's got 20 cc's of a brownish mucoid fluid, no refractive crystals from either the nebutal or the chlorohydrate. And so what that means is murder. In fact, you know, Noguchi eventually ended up coming out with probable suicide, and that was what he said he was forced to say. Because I spoke with uh, Caroline Barris, who was the daughter of Marilyn's last professional photographer, George Barris, 
And what she said was that Noguchi called her one day and was trying to reach her father, and they had a phone conversation for a long time, you know, Caroline and Noguchi. And what Noguchi was telling her was, I always believed it was murder, but they wouldn't let me say it. It was a big cover-up and that she had to have gotten the drugs intravenously as well as another method that was not through her mouth. And so he said that this was a really bad cover-up because all the pill bottles were, the, the, the caps were put back on the pill bottles. If it was really a suicide, they'd be all over the floor and the pills would be everywhere. But that's not how it was, so they didn't even do a good job of trying to cover up. And another person that uh, Noguchi told in confidence was Raymond Strait, who was Jane Mansfield's press secretary. He died recently, about 97 years old. And he said, he told me, he said that Noguchi never believed it was suicide. He wanted to blow the whole thing on Marilyn Monroe, but his superiors weren't having it. And so he was forced to put probable suicide, but he wanted to put murder. And he automatically, in his own book, you know, a ruled out accident because he said there's too many drugs in the body for that to be an accident. So he said that's out. He said it's either suicide or murder. Right. And you should say who Noguchi was for people that don't know. Oh, he was the autopsy surgeon who performed the autopsy on Marilyn. He also did the autopsy on Robert Kennedy, too. And Nebutal was the kind of, wasn't it a sleeping pill or something? Absolutely. Yeah, it was a sleeping pill. And that was uh, her drug of choice. You know, on average, her best friend, uh, her masseur, Ralph Roberts, said that Marilyn took on average about six Nebutals a day. So for there to be 47 in her blood... My God, that's overkill, you know. <laughs> what was the motive for the murder? Was it just to keep her quiet? There's a CIA document that we put in Terry's book, and it was dated August 3rd, 1962, and it proves that the CIA was aware that Bobby Kennedy and Marilyn, through wiretaps, they found out that Marilyn said she was going to hold a press conference, that she was going to uh, reveal her what she referred to as her diary of secrets, you know, the red diary that everybody keeps talking about. And if she was going to reveal national security secrets, it wasn't just the affairs with John and, and Bobby that she was going to reveal. She was going to reveal the President Kennedy's secret plot to kill Castro and the bases in Cuba and other such things that they didn't want, you know, the public to know about. And so they figured, well, this could be really bad. A lot of people could go to jail. And so the very next day on Saturday, they killed her, and she was going to hold that press conference on Monday morning. And what happened was, so according to Peter Lawford, you know, Bobby calls up Dr. Greenson, her psychiatrist, who was also having an affair with Marilyn, and Bobby found out somehow about the affair between Greenson and Marilyn and said, hey, look, Greenson, first thing Monday morning, she's going to expose not only me and Jack, but she's going to expose you too, which was actually a lie. She was only going to expose Bobby and Jack. She wasn't going to expose the affair with her psychiatrist, but Bobby made him think so. So Bobby tricked Greenson to get rid of Marilyn and we know this because when an ambulance was called by Mrs. Murray the housekeeper according to Norman Jeffries who was the handyman in Marilyn's house he told Donald Wolf that Mrs. Murray called an ambulance when she found her naked face down in the guest cottage and she was unconscious so they, they did the right thing and Mrs. Murray called the Schaefer ambulance and according to uh, my interview with Edgardo Villalobos, he said that he got the call first with his partner, Larry Telling. They were over at Beverly and Western, so if they had gone 100 miles an hour, they couldn't have gotten there in 15 minutes. You know, I mean, so what they did was they transferred it. Uh, Edgardo Villalobos said he told me personally that he transferred it to James Hall and Murray Leibowitz, who both made these observations that when they got on the scene, that, that she was uh, unconscious, she was nude in the guest cottage, not the bedroom she was later found, they moved her apparently. And they saw this, this publicist, Pat Newcomb, and she says, I, she's in there, I think she's dead, I think she's dead. And James Hall, the attendant, says, well, what's wrong with her? And Pat Newcomb says, I think she took some pills. So that directed James Hall to go smell Marilyn's mouth, and he noticed there was no indication of vomit, and he also noticed there was no odor of drugs and no odor of pear, which is a fruity smell when you take chlorohydrate. So even if Marilyn had, you know, mixed the chlorohydrate in a drink and drank it, that's not how it had happened. It didn't happen orally. And so he knew something was wrong. He said, this is very unusual for a suicide overdose. And so he put her on the, the floor, and they, they put a resuscitator on her. And as they're about to get her in the ambulance, you know, because they didn't even get her into the ambulance, they're, they're going to lift her up to go over there. But before that happens, they're still in the guest cottage. And this guy comes by in a suit, and he says, I'm her doctor. Give her positive pressure. So James Hall says, you never argue with a guy who says he's a medical doctor. You could lose your job. So he just lets him take over. And Dr. Greenson pulls out of his medical bag 
a hypodermic syringe with a heart needle already attached. He fills it with a brownish fluid, which is not adrenaline. It's pentobarbital, or a.k.a. nebitol. And he gives Marilyn an undiluted pentobarbital injection to the heart. Now, when you don't fill it with water first, it's undiluted. That kills the patient within one minute. And about a minute later, Dr. Greenson says, I'm going to pronounce you dead. You can leave. And so both James Hall and Murray Leibowitz told biographers that, yes, we saw Dr. Greenson kill her, but at the time we thought it was adrenaline, and when we saw the autopsy report later that she had an empty stomach, we started to question what we saw, but we always said it was a brownish fluid, which obviously is not adrenaline. What what do you think, um, getting away with this kind of a murder, I'm just wondering, um, why authorities have never pursued it. It's because, you know, when you're Robert Kennedy and you're going into her house before she's dead and you got these two police officers next to you, the police don't call on the police. you got the LAPD already there next to Bobby Kennedy making sure that anything that happens to him is, is not going to be, like getting arrested is not going to be the first thing on their list. you got a, a LAPD Detective James Ahern and Archie Case who had been bodyguards ever since Jack Kennedy was a senator in Massachusetts. So you got, like, real close friends who are LAPD right next to Bobby Kennedy, and they're going to, you know, do what Bobby Kennedy says. And they were part of the gangster squad, which was part of the -the off-the-books, you know, type of people who were doing things that were illegal, and they were working for the LAPD, part of Chief Parker's uh, gangster squad. And so the chief of police already knows about this. He's the one that headed the gangster squad, and, in fact, Fred Otash, uh, who was bugging Marilyn's house, he was former gangster squad and also former LAPD. And so the police doesn't call on the police. <laughs> you know, they keep it within their, themselves. In fact, uh, one of the witnesses to Marilyn's murder was Sergeant Marvin Iannone, uh, who James Hall said that as Greenson injected her in the heart, Peter Lawford entered the guest cottage along with Sergeant Marvin Iannone. And so when Peter Lawford said the following um, in his last interview, he said, Marilyn has got to be silenced, Bobby told Greenson, or words to that effect. Greenson had thus been set up by Bobby to take care of Marilyn. Well, everybody says, well, how did he take care of her? And the two attendants say with a heart needle. And so you got these three people, two attendants and Peter Lawford, the brother-in-law of Robert Kennedy, saying that Greenson murdered Marilyn. And the other two witnesses, Pat Newcomb and Sergeant Marvin Iannone, and since they're so close to the Kennedys, they have refused to comment on this case. Why would... Marilyn give this press conference. Uh, Why did she want to expose the Kennedys? She felt she was being used and she had learned about the whole thing where they would, you know, use people and then discard them. And she said, well, you're not going to do that to me. In fact, Raymond Strait uh, said that what happened on that last day was they were having a screaming match before she died. And, And Marilyn says, you're not just dealing with some extra here. I'm Marilyn Monroe. You don't know who you're dealing with. And then Robert Kennedy barked back at her and says, I'm Robert Kennedy. You don't know who you're dealing with, you know. (laughs) And so they were fighting back and forth. In fact, um, what what ended up happening was that Robert Kennedy, once, uh, you know, Marilyn threatened that press conference, uh, he said, if you threaten me, Marilyn, there's more than one way to keep you quiet. So there was some real, there were real things happening that were going down that day. And just hours later, she's dead. And is it any coincidence that Robert Kennedy's, you know, still <laughs> near her house, you know, after she's dead? In fact, seven miles from the crime scene at Robertson and Olympic Boulevard at 12, 10 a.m., Detective Lynn Franklin from the Beverly Hills Police Department pulls over a drunk Peter Lawford driving 75 miles an hour in the Lincoln Continental Sedan. And in the back seat is Bobby Kennedy, and the front seat is a guy who Peter Lawford says, oh, he's just a doctor, he's riding along with us. In fact, uh, Franklin later identified Greenson from the funeral footage of Marilyn a few days later and said that's the guy who was the doctor that Lawford was referring to, was Dr. Greenson, was in the front seat. So you got the murderer in the front seat. You got Peter Lawford who said that Greenson had been set up by Bobby to take care of Marilyn. You got Bobby Kennedy in the back seat. And people say, well, how do you know it was Bobby Kennedy in the back seat? And Franklin says, well, I recognized him because I was on his security detail sometimes. So I knew that was Bobby Kennedy. Not only um, he would also mention the fact that uh, Lawford says, oh, we got to get the attorney general over here back to the airport so he can fly out of town. So, you know, there was a lot of confirmation that he wasn't mistaken about that being Bobby Kennedy. So what do you what do you think your reaction, or have you had any reaction from from anybody that's in the Kennedy family or that sort of um, 
you know, area. Well, I've, you know, noticed that uh, Lisa Peace, who's a Robert Kennedy researcher, she's apparently a um, self-proclaimed friend of Robert Kennedy Jr., and she says, oh, well, I tried to convince Robert Kennedy Jr. that Marilyn's death was an accident. Well, you know, as we discussed before, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, the coroner, did the autopsy of Marilyn, has already negated that possibility. In fact, she tried to say that he was quoted as saying it was an accident. That's false. He's never been quoted as saying that. He always said that was just not a possibility. And so I, I know that he can't like me very much because I'm accusing his father of killing Marilyn. But, you know, I go where the witnesses tell me. And that, you know, if they're credible, then you have to follow what they say. And, and the evidence, you know, her stomach is empty. Somebody murdered her. It definitely wasn't the mafia. It was Greenson, which means that the mafia didn't murder her. And so there's just so much evidence. In fact, you know, now that my book has come out, it's become a New York Times bestseller. A lot of people are just focusing on the fact that she was murdered, and there are other people coming out with books, um, and it, it's just it, it's a start of something that that really needed to get started because this this is something that should not be unresolved. It's not fair to say that Marilyn should be a suicide accident or murder. We got to finally you know get this thing straight, and and it's it's proper to say that we need to focus on murder. What do you think of that will ever happen, but do you think that there will be any sort of justice towards that and how you want to see it go? There's a one way it could happen. You know, what you could do, and it's probably unlikely, but it is possible, is uh, to take some of uh, her hair that was uh, cut off of her after her death. Alan Abbott, who was one of the pallbearers, he had uh, cut off some of her hair after her death, and he kept it, and he sold some of it over the years. In fact, he sold some of it to this French... Uh, a guy who did a documentary recently that was able to use that hair to prove that Marilyn's real father was Charles Stanley Gifford. And so they were able to do tests on that. Now, they could do the same thing to find out if there were any paralyzing chemicals that were not found in the autopsy that would prove this definitively and say, yes, because there were chemicals here, she was murdered and nothing else. That would definitely change her certificate of death, you know, from probable suicide to, to homicide. So that would be interesting, if, but, but they would also have to get some fingernails from her crypt, so they'd have to exhume her crypt, and I don't think they're going to go into her crypt and, you know, take out any fingernails, but if they did, it would definitely put an end to this whole thing and just have it as homicide, and then then everybody could just start talking about who did it. And my book, you know, proves that it was Greenson. I, I believe that very strongly. Uh, Greenson's not alive anymore, right? He died in 1979. So, yeah, yeah. So does he have any family um, nowadays that are, are around? Um, Greenson uh, just has a daughter that's around. The, the Danny and uh, Hildy, the wife, uh, Danny was a son. They both died in 2012, and Joan Greenson is the only one who's still around. But I've heard stories where certain, like, distant nephews or cousins of Greenson have said, oh, my God, like, why is he being accused of this? This is so crazy. Like, so there there are people reacting from his family who are surprised, and they're just wondering why people are going after him. <laughs> they don't really understand why. Well, that's a tough thing, you know, to, to kind of, uh, if, if you have no idea about one of your relatives, right, and you start hearing stories, it's, you know, you yeah. aren't there, so it's, too, you know, it's tough. But at the end of the day, you don't think there would be any changes from this? Like no one's actually going to get arrested or there's not going to be any anything like that that happens from it? Even though there are no statute of limitations on murder, um, you know, I don't see Pat Newcomb or Sergeant Marvin Iano getting arrested. They're the last dregs of the <laughs> conspiracy. And, and, you know, Peter Lawford is dead, Bobby Kennedy's dead, Greenson is dead. So the three main players are gone, and it's just, they're never, I mean, you can't try dead people for murder, so that's the end of that. It's been too long, and it, it, it's taken all this time to really figure it out. Everybody had, like, a little bit of the story, and with my interviews, I was able to get more information to prove that an ambulance was called. I interviewed three ambulance attendants, including the former Vice President Schaefer's, they all named the same, you know, guy, Joe Tarnowski, as the guy who was the dispatcher on that call. So there was an ambulance call that day, you know, which proves that James Hall and Murray Leibowitz, because Edgardo Villalobos told me that they were the ones that were by UCLA. They responded within two minutes, and they were able to get there the quickest. 
And they, they were able to prove that this ambulance story was true. And if you believe that the ambulance story is true, well, then you have to believe that Hall and Leibowitz are telling the truth and they saw this murder. And that's, that's what happened. And Peter Lawford confirms it. it it's uh, very fascinating because nobody had ever put Lawford's testimony next to the ambulance attendants before. That's what I do that's different is that I combine them and say, well, these, two, these, these testimonies match each other. They complement each other. They're trying to tell you the real story. So the fascination with Maryland keeps coming in waves. I noticed there was Michelle Morgan, I believe it was, just had a series on, I think it was CNN, and I know she was on the show and all that. So it keeps coming where, you know, and there's a Netflix one out now too. Um, why do you think the fascination is with Maryland? I think the fascination is that everybody thinks they know who she is, but they really don't, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes you get a good thing about Maryland, sometimes you get a terrible thing about Maryland. This whole thing with that blonde by Anna Disarmus, what a horrible, horrible thing. It's based on a fictional book on Maryland, so it's no truth to it, and yet they use real names from her life, like Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller, and it was just an awful film. I saw the movie on Netflix, and I got to tell you, this does not represent the Marilyn that Terry knew. And that's really why Terry decided to write the book. She told me recently, she said, she said, I don't want to profit by knowing Marilyn. I don't want to go on the TV shows and get celebrity attention. You know, and she says, I'm not, it's not me, you know, but I do want to get out there with this book. You know, that this is the people need to know who she really was. And this blonde thing is definitely not who she was. It made her look stupid. It made her look like an air brain. It made her look like everything that she isn't. You know, and just because, you know, she was called a dumb blonde, I guess they kind of assumed that they could make that her whole life, and that was just completely wrong. And there were certain, um, while Marilyn had been raped, you know, in the Calneva, and she was raped as a child, you know, they tried to make certain closer friends of hers, you know, like Charlie Chaplin Jr., and make it look like they were raping her, which is not true, and they had all the pornographic slapping sounds it was really disgusting and this is the the most horrible thing you can imagine you're like really you're gonna have that and it's just like no 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 this is just not who she was she was a sweet person she was not stupid like they portrayed her in that thing and and, and anna disarmist gets a golden globe nomination oh god what a travesty that she even got nominated please that is just wretched did the studio create Marilyn's dumb blonde persona or is it something that she developed to, uh, to kind of create a, a I, I guess, a character or a, for lack of a better word, use the term persona, persona again uh, within her movies? She created a, a sort of persona that she repeated, and it, I guess the studios kind of uh, dubbed it the dumb blonde persona, even though that's not what she called it. And it's because of the scripts that she was given. You know, she was an intelligent woman, and they're trying to, you know, pigeonhole her in these, these scripts where she's acting like she's really stupid, you know, like where she doesn't know certain locations in Europe or something, you know, and it's just like, okay, you know, how funny. But it only gets funny for so long. And if you look at uh, one of her earlier pictures, 1952, uh, Don't Bother to Knock, she plays a deranged babysitter, and there's none of that dumb blonde in her. She's a very smart, calculating babysitter who's kind of like a... It's like a horror film, you know, she's the bad guy, you know, or bad woman. And, and it's just really interesting how um, it's nothing like that dumb blonde stuff that they kept putting out there. It's a very unique film. And then you got Bus Stop, which was a film that she made where she's got an Ozark accent very convincingly. And uh, her co-star, Don Murray, thought that she could have been nominated for an Academy Award for that. And that was in 1956, you know. So she was trying to, that's why she hooked up with Milton Green, Milton H. Green, the photographer, to form a production company, Marilyn Monroe Productions. And she got bus stop on that list. And then the next year, she, in 1957, she made The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier. And this was not the dumb blonde image that she was, you know, the studios had kind of pushed on her time and time again. And so she's trying to move away from that. And then when she did The Misfits, her last completed film, you know, she did another film that um, something's got to give, but that was not complete. And uh, her last completed film was The Misfits uh, before she died with Clark Gable, her childhood idol. And this was a film that was totally not her dumb blonde. In fact, Arthur Miller wrote it based on who she really was. And because it hit so close to home, she had time uh, time and time again. to. It was very difficult for her to play this role because there was a lot of hurt there. 
you know, he would write about a lot of painful moments in her own life. And so when she was trying to reenact them, she kind of had difficulty doing that because she took it very sensitively, you know. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. But, you know, back in the 60s and 50s and all that, they um, society in general um, wasn't going to buy a smart smart woman. You know what I mean? Right. You know, they, they sort of had the attitude that a, a woman that was – Real beautiful and and blonde and all that stuff. That they, they, a lot of the guys just didn't take that seriously. They thought, well, yeah, you know, she's just a sex idol. Exactly. And then when the big hit, the biggest hit that she made, "Some Like It Hot," I mean, it's on the top, you know, um, best films. I mean, it's like wow, you know. And, and so that kind of didn't help either because when she's trying to make films after "Some Like It Hot." You know, like uh, Let's Make Love, which was a box office disappointment, and The Misfits, which barely made the, enough money it you know took to make it. Um, it was something that was. It was almost like they they just wanted to see dumb blonde over and over again. And when she was trying to do something different, they weren't really giving her a chance. And she got a little disappointed over that. And so when she was making Something's Got to Give, which was incomplete with Dean Martin, that was kind of a a little bit of a back to this sort of image that they wanted, but it wasn't dumb blonde, though. It was, she's blonde and she's platinum, she's skinnier than she's ever been, and, but it was a more, it was more like her, who she was in real life, you know, because she was, she had been shipwrecked and she hadn't seen her children for five years, according to the story, so when she sees them at Dean Martin's house, he's been remarried to the Sid Cherise character, and she's coming in pretending she's the new uh, Swedish babysitter, you know. And so she sees these two kids who are hers, and she's they're five years old now. She hadn't seen them since they were born. And she's looking at them with such wonder. And she's using all that wonder that she would have if she could really have kids because she had endometriosis. She could never have kids. And so every time she got pregnant, it never worked out. And so when she's looking at these kids, you're like, wow, that's real acting right there. That's Academy Award winning stuff. You know, it's not the dumb blonde stuff, but it's like the real acting coming out of her. She's got the platinum hair. She looks like the Marilyn that we see from those the movies that the studio wanted her to make. And she's also going to be completely naked in the swimming pool, you know, without any body, um, you know, attachments that cover her, her body. It's She's completely naked. And so she's kind of doing something like the seven-year itch, you know, where she has her, like, dress go up. So it's a similar type of, you know, fascination. She's like, oh, here's the gimmick. I'll be naked in the swimming pool. Everybody will come see the movie. I mean, I tried that, but nobody <laughs> <laughs> Closed after one hour. <laughs> and, uh... That's great. So now... Yeah, well, so now, so let's talk about you. How do people find you? Do you do social media? Do you like interacting with readers and fans on social media? Do you have a website? Uh, where do people find Jay? Well, on uh, Instagram, Marilyn Murdered, you know, with an uh, ED at the end. So uh, Marilyn Murdered and an ED. And uh, you can find me at, at Marilyn Murdered on Instagram. I, you know, have close to 11,000 followers, always looking for some more. And I have clips of my interviews on there. You can hear other interviews I've conducted. You can uh, see the upcoming uh, clips I have on there about my Robert Kennedy books. In fact, I'm writing two Robert Kennedy books, uh, one on, uh, that I'm writing by myself. It's a full-length book on the assassination, who really killed Robert Kennedy. I do know who killed Robert Kennedy. It was not Sirhan Sirhan. I'm also writing another Robert Kennedy book with my co-author, Scott Enyart, and he was uh, 15 years old at the time of the shooting for Fairfax High, his uh, his newspaper. He, he was a photographer, and he's 69 now, but he was taking pictures as Robert Kennedy was being shot, and this woman named Joan Barr said, hey, that kid was taking pictures while Kennedy was being shot, so the police went right after him, wouldn't le let him leave the hotel, confiscated his camera, put him on a recording, which has been played in documentaries before, and he said that he stood on a steam table, he didn't say steam table at the time, but he said he stood on a table and he was taking pictures as Kennedy was being shot. In fact, we were going to put uh, in the book for the first time a picture by this guy, an uh, amateur photographer named Richard Harrison, who actually took a picture of Scott as uh, he was standing on the table and he was, uh, you could see that he's clearly taking a picture. And so that proves that Scott was in the pantry. And not only that, but Ted Chirac, who did the famous Second Gun documentary, which got nominated for a Golden Globe, uh, he also said that um, that he was walking into the pantry and he saw a kid standing on a steam table taking pictures, and he testified to that at Scott's trial because Scott sued the city of Los Angeles in 1996 
to get his pictures back. And so he won a judgment of $600,000, and then on appeal, the city uh, won, and they reversed it because of anti-police bias from the jury, which is a bunch of nonsense. You know, the city just didn't want to have egg on their face, so they were trying to get, like, a one-up on him. But in essence, you know, Scott won that case. Hope he didn't spend the money. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, are you running a website or no? Uh, well, I have Maryland Murdered, which is uh, what I consider my, my official website. It's my Instagram, and that's right. where people okay. can find me. They can definitely get updates. They can get a link to the book that I'm currently, um, you know, have out, which is my Meryl. Marilyn Monroe, uh, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood, and me. And you can find my other books from that link, too. And I'm constantly updating it with other clips, you know, from interviews I do. And people can really find out about what they need to from me, from that, you know, Instagram. Was it was it hard doing the research? Like when you uh, interview people and kind of start talking to them and, and you want to do a book about this sort of thing, are people pretty open about that or were they a little bit uh, closed? I think, you know, that after I became a New York Times bestselling author, it opens a lot of doors when you say that and people want to talk to you. And I sometimes surprise myself about how I get people to cooperate. You know, I've uh, for the Robert Kennedy thing, I've had to go a little bit deeper by getting people uh, under professional forensic hypnotism, which is accepted in court. And so I've had, uh, you know, four, uh, excuse me, three people already hypnotized including Juan Romero, who was the busboy who shook Robert Kennedy's hand. He has since passed away. But it, it allowed them to, you know, definitively say that they saw a certain thing. Like, for example, Juan Romero um, was unsure if he had maybe possibly seen a third shooter. And so when he went under hypnosis, we were able to determine that he only saw Sirhan firing a gun. So it was able to unblock that little confusion in his mind. And it was very helpful to do that because some people say, well, maybe hypnotism can unduly influence a witness. But if you do it right, you know, it could actually get to the truth and, and help people. See, there's, see, while I did discover there were witnesses that saw a third shooter, I mean, if, if somebody said that they only saw Sir Hand, well, then I notate that and I move on. You know, I'm not here to say that everybody saw it. I mean, only the people that really did see it, you know, so... Um, I'm, you know, considered the conspiracy author. However, if I don't find a conspiracy, I'm going to notate that. I'm an honest guy. I'm not going to start saying that somebody saw something they didn't. In fact, Lisa Pease, you know, continues to write that Juan Romero saw a third shooter in her book, and she only met him in a Netflix premiere. So that wasn't very helpful that she didn't do what I did with him with the hypnotism and found the truth. And she's, you know, going around spreading, you know, stuff that's not true. Yeah, it's a lot of that. In this business, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff out there, and you kind of have to uh, be wary of what, what, you know, people are saying and doing. You have to be careful. Exactly. You never know what they're going to say, you know. Fake news. <laughs> anyway. uh, well, we really appreciate you coming back and kind of filling us in on what's been going on and, and your new book and stuff. So uh, that's fantastic. So now the book, of course, we're talking about is My Merrill, and it's Marilyn Monroe. Ronald Reagan, Hollywood, and me. And that was written by uh, Jay Margolis. So uh, thanks for coming on the show, Jay. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks, Jay. All right. Take care, guys. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.